So if you've missed out, recently I've been doing a series where I've been going back and talking about the basics. We have been starting with extracts and we started with APIs. Now let's go to the next place that a lot of companies extract data from, or at least share data and pull data and push data from, which is using SFTP or Secure File Transfer Protocol. Now, some of you may have never heard of SFTP or maybe have never had to use it, but many companies out there rely on it because one, it's generally easier than building an entire API. And it's very useful when you just have to send very specific file or very specific set of files to either an external partner or internal partner that can then take that data and, and ingest it. Some examples of this might include uh, where I worked at one company, we would get insurance companies sending us files on enrollment, uh, actual claims. So like what you might go to the doctor for and the claims, pharmaceutical data and eligibility data. And we would have that sent to us from again, like 40 or 50 odd insurance providers. And we would pull that all in, standardize it and create dashboards, analytics, reports, and also develop some algorithms to help the insurance companies make decisions. You also had this happen a lot with some e-commerce companies, uh, credit card companies and uh, ad tech companies who would just, that's how they share data about their users, about what products you bought. And then they would ingest that in versus again, versus an API. They would just send you a file at the end of the day. It would be something like a CSV, TSV, pipe delimited, um, there's a few other file types that someone would use to send you um, data. Basically, the way it looks like is you write generally a query on your database and you have a script that pulls that data out and, and runs that query. You then use SFTP to send that data or possibly drop that data into your own server. So you either have a server on your side or they have a server on their side that you drop that file in and then they either go to your server, log in, pick it up, or they go into their server uh, and pick it up. But it's a really confident approach. I mean, I see it at companies all the time and at a lot of the large companies because it is just easy to do, especially if you already have the server set up that allows for SFTP. And again, really what you're doing with SFTP is you're just taking the file, the file of users, the files of, again, patients could be the claims and you're just pushing it so that it will likely be integrated somewhere else in a data warehouse. Um, in some cases, this is less analytical, more operational. Maybe you have some workflow that's created and you need to maybe get all the employees of a certain company integrated into some other system that you have. And similar to an API, you have a lot of different ways you can actually do SFTP. A few less, luckily, it's a little, little more restrictive, but it still has a few options. So let's start with the basics again, which is user authentication. You still have to authenticate somehow, right? Either you're logging into their server or they're logging into your server. Somehow it's someone is logging into a server. The most basic way obviously is password and username. That is the straightforward way, but you can also use an SSH key. That is another way where you have a secure shell key or SSH key. The server holds the public key in this case and then you, uh, the end user have the private key that you use to sign in with. And oftentimes in my experience, when I worked at companies like Facebook, you would have a plethora of ways that people would allow you to sign in. Meaning you had to have scripts that could manage that, you know, a script that could say like, okay, if I give you a password, assume this is a password approach. Or if I give you an SSH key, assume that that is the approach. You're also going to have things like whitelisting uh, as well, but those are the general ways I've authenticated. I'm sure there's others, but those are the ways I've authenticated. Now, the next part of this is, and this is usually that can be the frustrating part is many of these files tend to be encrypted usually using PGP or pretty good privacy encryption, which can take a few different forms in terms of like how you approach this. For example, you might have once again, that public and private key approach where your public key encrypts the file and then your private key is used to decrypt the file and only the recipient has the private key file that allows them to decrypt the data. But that is really just the basic way, right? Like PGP key pair uh, encryption is one approach where again, the recipient will create this public key that they share out and they keep the private key and the public key is used to encrypt data and then only the private key can decrypt it. Now at Facebook, before I left, one thing that we started to do that we wanted to set up was actually use PGP encryption plus a signature. So what that basically means is you actually now have two key pairs, right? Both sides have a private key and both sides have a public key for different things, right? So the recipient in this case has done what we talked about prior, which is they sent a public key out to allow for encryption while they have the private key that decrypts it. But on the flip side, the person who's sending the data uses another private key to sign the data that they're sending. And then you, the recipient or whoever the recipient is, uh, uses the public key to check that, hey, this sender was the sender that we're expecting, right? Because, and the reason this is, and it's just more secure, right? Like now you know that this data and this file you're getting 
is not possibly, you know, something that could hack your entire system as you bring it in or, or has some bad data or has anything that could like corrupt to what you have, right? Now it's super, super secure, right? Like we both know that this data, where this data came from, we know it's the right place and we know that it's been secured and the only people that can decrypt it is us. There's a few other methods too. You can use passwords, uh, even on the symmetric key itself. You also can use just a password. I've had that happen where you just use a password. There's no PGP. It's just a password on the file. Uh, and that's, that's the safety. That's what you have, just a password. And we're about to show you kind of a script of how you could do this. I'm gonna use Paramico. Again, this is one of those things that I've never had to say out loud. I just see it. So I'm curious if that's how you say it but um, we're gonna use that and actually code it out just so you can see how to do it. Honestly, it's one of those things you probably copy paste from somewhere, depending on how complex you need to make it. You know, if you have to make it very generic, you're gonna start copy pasting it and then you're gonna have to add a ton of extra functionality to it. You know, either some sort of conditional or you're gonna have to make it, you know, a little more generic like an SFTP operator. But before that, let's talk about some other things to consider. So you're sending data from some somewhere and what happens, there's a few steps that actually happen in this process that I didn't talk about which is all the conversations between these two companies. Generally, what happens if you are going to receive an SFTP file is someone will send you, hopefully, a document that says, hey, here's how we deal with all this stuff, encryption, you know, how to log into our server, where our server is, so on and so forth. You're not gonna have the password in that. It's just gonna tell you how to interact with them. And then it's gonna also have the schema file. So like, what am I actually pulling over, right? Because a lot of these files that you pull, Sometimes they have headers, sometimes they don't. And sometimes the only way you kind of can know what's coming in the file is via, they give you a header file, the file already has a header, or you are being told what the schema is ahead of time and you're ingesting it, expecting a specific schema. So there's that aspect of it. You have to understand, well, how's this file coming in? Do I have a header? Do I have no header? Uh, am I being told or what is the actual schema? So you get the schema file, you compare it. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a schema file and then Two months later, they change it. And I'm like, you broke what we had. You told me this is what it is and you've, you've broken it. I mean, that happens with APIs too. Schemas change. That's just how it is. But it happens all the time. And so hopefully you can detect it. You know, if there's a header or a header file, you can detect it. If there's no header, you can only detect it based off of data type really and say like, hey, have data types changed. So you can have that check in there to make sure that are the data types what I expect. And so that's why I usually like to have different checks at the raw layer of ingestion. And then also another thing that might come with that file is some sort of checksum or aggregate file. So let's say, for example, when I talk about claims, you might have a file that comes in that tells you the total number of claims and the total dollar of claims that should be expected in this file. So this is just a double check to make sure, hey, the file I got in, nothing is missing. You know, if they added some new where condition or something to it, or some data was missing from a different source, you have some very basic query that was implemented that should be a checksum essentially. Like, hey, if you take your data, the raw, the more granular data and sum it up and you do not have the same number of rows and the dollar amount is different, the data is wrong, right? And so that's generally just a simple way to check it. They often have a little aggregate check. And then again, the other checks that you often have is like data type checks, make sure, hey, did all, did all the dates come in as dates? Are they the date format I expect? All these little things along the way, because you don't have much control here, right? You are really just trusting that someone else's system is creating the right data that you will expect. And honestly, like I said, this is how a lot of stuff happens everywhere. But let's dive into some code really quick um, and then we'll kind of wrap this video up. All right, so just diving into uh, a basic example of an SFTP or how you could actually interact with an SFTP via Python. Here is kind of a basic script. It's very similar in terms of like variable names and uh, some of the basic functionality. It's not too dissimilar than the one uh, that I used at Facebook. Obviously that one was a little more built out. It had a lot more uh, complex functionality because we had to handle uh, being able to decide, okay, are we going down the route of using a key pair or a username and password to log in? You know, which one, which route are we going? There was a case or when I started leaving, we uh, actually had varying ways that you could actually sign a file right? They were actually encouraging us towards the end to go through the full process of essentially both having someone sign, if you recall, like you can actually sign a file so you know who the the person who is sending the file is. And then on our side, we could actually check, hey, is this person who sent us this file? Are they the person we think they are? Uh, as well as encrypt it. So they'd actually do both. They both encrypt the file and sign it so that we knew where it came from. And so there's that process. And in some cases, people would send us files with just the password encrypting it. So uh, there's just varying ways you can encrypt files. So you have to have different paths for that. So that's why you'll see here, right? Like you will always have a host. You might also have either username and password or possibly if you're just for sign in using uh, an SFTP private key, you might have that. And again, you may have a passphrase or you might just have a key. 
And there's again, there's a lot of different options uh, that you could have in terms of how you could encrypt and then decrypt your file. From there, again, this is a pretty straightforward example. We would set up a GPT, you know, initialize that so that it's ready so that if we have to import a key, we can. And then we kind of go through a pretty straightforward example of how to first download the file. And I'll talk about this a little bit here in a second uh, and then decrypt the file. So we have two functions here. So step one, you actually have to interact or connect to said host, right? So you're going to use uh, Paramco. Again, that's one of those things. I just assume that's how you say it. I uh, never heard it out loud. But you uh, set up that initial connection and then figure out, okay, how are you going to actually uh, connect? Are you going to use a private key? Are you going to use uh, a password and username? And depending on how you want to set this up, uh, you might just use a simple if else statement here. It depends on how complex, again, you, you need to deal with um, in terms of authentication. But these are the only two I've ever had to use. So using a simple if else statement usually works. Now, you've essentially set up a client that can inter interact with that SFTP server. So anything you can generally do on an SFTP server, uh, any of the commands you can run, you can run here. So I'll put up some commands you could in theory run. Uh, and in terms of like what Pramco lets you run. Uh, in this case, we're going to first start uh, the session. And then from there, you may or may not have to go to a specific file path or location. Um, but then the, the goal will be to actually get that file. This will feel very familiar to you if you're used to like getting an HTTP request. Very, very similar concept, right? You're, you're just going to get this and then pull it. And then you're essentially downloading it. And then from there, you can uh, close it. And you're basically going to give it the remote path and the local file path. So where are you looking? Where does where's this file exist and where are you going to put it? And up, up above, if you recall, we gave it that information, right? So here's where we would find it. Here's where we're going to download it. Um, and we're assuming right now that it is encrypted. So thus you see this .gpg. So once you've downloaded it um, and gotten it, you can actually do the decryption approach. And again, you're going to take this local file path. You know that that's where it is. And from there, it's pretty straightforward, right? GPG has a pretty straightforward decrypt file functionality that you can use to parse the data out to decrypt the data um, and then use, again, either a passphrase. If it's a passphrase, um, you might have, again, a PGP key. Now, in some cases, you might not actually have uh, a passphrase on your actual private key. It's not recommended. I have seen it happen. Again, this is why I've seen like different combinations of how people might decrypt a file. But again, generally speaking, you should have a passphrase. In fact, I remember one project got <laughs> delayed because someone didn't realize that they created this passphrase and they didn't hand it to me before going on vacation. They created the key and they're like, here it is. And they were in a different time zone. So by the time I got it, they were gone and, and, I, and I couldn't get to them. So uh, it delayed it delayed the project because they put a passphrase on the key, didn't realize it, sent me the key and, and I couldn't use it. So it is very important uh, to, to know that. Once you do that, you can check to make sure that your decrypted data is essentially okay, right? Like, were there any issues uh, decrypting the data? Sometimes there are. And then from there, you can essentially just write it, right? Like with, with uh, open your de decrypted file path, like you would normally uh, with most write operations with files, right? You're going to open it and then write to it. Uh, in this case, we're putting it in a TXT file. It might be a CSV. It might be pipe delimited. Whatever it is, make sure you label it correctly. Although text will handle most of those uh, for parsing later. And then from there, you're going to end up either pushing it somewhere to get loaded later or loaded immediately, right? Like this, this is just essentially your extract step, right? Uh, the extract being from an SFTP, right? From here, you are downloading it. Not too dissimilar. Again, you can think about it, downloading data from an API, but instead from an SFTP and just a file. Uh, and then the extra step that you have is this decryption. So that's the basics of pulling data from an SFTP and downloading it and then decrypting it. And I can put this basic script up so you can use it. With that, let's go back to the rest of the video. So as you can see, SFTP is a very common use case and you probably will have to write one at some point. Some of these tend to be IT integrations that you might not have to do as a data engineer, but it's good to know if you ever have to do it. I had to do like five at Facebook or I don't remember I had to make. And yes, we had an SFTP operator, but it didn't work. So my team basically had made their own and we used our own uh, version of SFTP because I think we were one of the main teams interacting with it. Nowadays, there also is data sharing. So a lot of companies, you know, Snowflake, uh, Databricks, I'm sure a few other companies have, have it or are working on it, which makes this whole process considerably easier. And at some point, it'd be nice to have data sharing take over. But I think the hard thing here is SFTP is standard, or at least you don't have to buy a vendor. You don't have to be a, a customer of a vendor to work with it. And Snowflake data sharing only works with Snowflake. And so then you need a third party just to interact with 
you know, this data sharing component. Because there are third parties that exist that allow you to data share in between these different systems, but it just kind of sucks, right? Like we're adding more layers where it should just be simpler, where Snowflake should just allow you to data share with everything. And, you know, now that we've added an iceberg in, it probably makes that transition a little easier. Hopefully as people build out that, they will take that into consideration, right? Like in a perfect world, it shouldn't matter what engine sits on top. You should just be able to share data easily. But obviously there is business involved and people want to win and make more money. So I, I doubt we will actually get an easy integration across. But here's to hoping that that's what happens, that whatever data sharing looks like in the future can get rid of SFTP. Because honestly, in many degrees, I don't like SFTP, but it is what exists and it is something I've had to do a lot. So hopefully this was helpful in understanding the basics of SFTP. And with that, I will see you all in the next video. Thanks all. Goodbye.